This cathedral has its own legend, a legend of the devil and a wolf. The story goes that the people of Aachen had run out of money. So to build the chapel, they made a deal with the devil. He would provide the money and in return receive the first soul to enter the chapel. But the clever townsfolk sent in a wolf and denied the devil his due. The imperial chapel in Aachen was said to be so glorious, so beautiful and so tall that it could be seen from the Alps. In the year 800, it was the first vaulted structure north of the Alps. Over the centuries, it's been given many names. The chapel, the Marienkirche, and the cathedral. A work of architecture and art, it is overlaid with history. An enigmatic throne stands on the gallery, where dozens of German kings of the Holy Roman Empire were crowned. It is enclosed by original Carolingian lattices forged after ancient models. Charlemagne had 32 magnificent columns brought especially from Rome and Ravenna, a building of treasures. No wonder that Aachen Cathedral was chosen as Germany's first UNESCO World Heritage Site. The building is the product of and strongly charged with its history. It's the only Carolingian building that has survived so intact today, and it has been the model for very, very many sacral buildings. So little remains from this early period, and it's really very impressive. It was destined to be listed 40 years ago. Aachen Cathedral was listed as a World Heritage Site in 1978. What makes this building so special, so fascinating? The cathedral is closely connected with Charlemagne, who had it built. A figure of history and legend who was crowned emperor in the year 800. In this portrait, the Marienkirche rests on his arm, depicting him as the church's founder. It's all so symbolic that it's easy to forget he was a real person. We have to remember that these are all just different representations of power and grandeur. It conveys that power. For more than 1,200 years, the deeds of Charlemagne have captured our imagination. What is certain is that he founded the great Carolingian Empire. No authentic portrait of him exists. Only one text, written around the year 830, has survived. Yeah. 
Charles was large and strong and of lofty stature, though not disproportionately tall. His height is well known to have been seven times the length of his foot. The upper part of his head was round. His eyes were very large and animated, nose a little long, hair fair, and face laughing and merry. Thus his appearance was always stately and dignified, whether he was standing or sitting. His gait was firm, his whole carriage manly, and his voice clear, but not so strong as his size led one to expect. The biographer describes the emperor as a man of the people. In contrast, the Marienkirche, today's Aachen Cathedral, is imperially staged, majestic, Nothing is left to chance. Charlemagne had his throne erected on the gallery. Today it may seem archaic and strange, but it is charged with meaning. The rough marble slabs were brought from Jerusalem, the holy city. An ancient board game scratched into the surface shows that the slabs were once part of a floor. But why did the marble throne have to come from Jerusalem? Charlemagne hoped for redemption in a life marked by war. He founded the Western Roman Frankish Empire as an antithesis to the Eastern Byzantine Empire. Charlemagne greatly expanded the borders of the Frankish Empire in various directions to the southwest, towards present-day Catalonia, and he expanded it towards Italy by annexing the Lombard Kingdom. He also annexed Bavaria and expanded the empire to the north, conquering Saxony. So he moved from the Rhine to the Elbe. This imperial expansion was politically driven. Charlemagne wanted to increase the resources available to his empire, knowing that conquest also ensured fealty. Charlemagne's life followed the changing seasons. In summer, he went into battle. In the fall, hunting. But winter was the time for rest and reflection. Aachen was his preferred winter residence. This chapel in particular was decisive for inscription on the World Heritage List. It symbolizes the unification and spiritual and political renewal of the West under his rule. Charlemagne is said to have attended services here several times a day. Charlemagne's 
Aachen Cathedral is steeped in myth and legend, like the legend of the devil and the wolf. It said the devil lost his thumb when the door slammed shut, and it is still stuck in the mouth of one of the bronze lion heads. According to legend, the devil slammed the door with such force that it cracked at the bottom. The cathedral reveals one secret only at a second glance. Inside, the structural elements join in fine harmony. The octagon was designed in both height and width with an elaborate numeric symbolism, as simple as it is ingenious. The building's structure is geometric, composed of circles and squares. The cupola mounted on top of the octagon describes a perfect hemisphere. If you mirror this downwards, it meets the floor precisely. The proportions, one to one, one to two, one to three, all relate to each other. I don't know of any other building that reproduces its proportions so completely. It's quite extraordinary. What purpose do these geometric principles serve? The building is meant to symbolize creation, even the perfection of a divine order, inspired by the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem. The church is a sign of faith, hewn from stone. We can assume that the numbers are symbolic. The central measurement of the octagon is 48 feet, 6 times 8 feet. These two basic numbers determine the entire building. The 8, because the octagon has 8 sides, and in the Christian faith stands for the resurrection, and six has been known as a perfect number since antiquity. And these two numbers meet here again, referring back to the holy city of Jerusalem. But even a divine building does not just appear fully formed. Aachen Cathedral was built on a massive foundation. Former cathedral architect Helmut Mainz now a member of the administrative chapter, opens a shaft exposing traces from the Roman period. These are remains of a Roman thermal bath, which was here long before the cathedral. This is a hypocaust system where these little stone towers are piled on top of each other. Fire or heated air was channeled through this cavity. This was early underfloor or wall heating. We know the Romans always had warm thermal baths and hot water. This is a nice remnant of that. So before Charlemagne, Aachen was a Roman spa town. It seems almost a miracle that these remains from the Roman period have been preserved, because the Carolingian walls on top are far more massive. It was strengthened with a special brick mortar and has lasted for 1,200 years. The Carolingian foundation extends five meters down.
zur Zeit ganz des Großen. So it was um. probably finished around the year 805, so during Charlemagne's lifetime. An incredibly short building time. Specialists must have been brought in from all over the empire, maybe even Lombards from northern Italy, to be able to realize this. Shortly before 800, there would still have been a large number of remains from antiquity everywhere. And they provided the builders here with stone. In other words, stone blocks came from ancient buildings and ruins and were used here to build the Palatine Chapel. Materials from further away were also used, for example, limestone from Lorraine. That shows that they had a very good supply chain, because they needed a continuous flow of materials. That was certainly part of what made it possible to erect this building in a short amount of time. The cathedral's structural complexity becomes apparent in its rooftop, 35 meters up. Aachen Cathedral is considered a prototype of religious architecture, one of the criteria used in the UNESCO evaluation. The octagon is a masterwork. This is the main building, an octagon. The walls are about 1 meter 60 thick, so that's quite a lot of material. On top is the cupola, which is also an octagon. Those walls are 1 meter 30 thick, so it's all incredibly heavy. In a cupola, the forces angle toward the walls, so the walls will tend to drift apart. And that has to be prevented. That's why they built this iron ring anchor into the masonry, to hold a whole thing together like a ring, or like a barrel. That was very innovative back then. It's quite amazing. In 800, a structural core was unique in Northern Europe. Aachen's model was the San Vitale Church in Ravenna, Italy. It had been built 250 years before as a two-story octagon with golden mosaics. Charlemagne certainly wanted to build a miniature Ravenna. Even before he had an imperial title, he wanted to allude to his kinship with the Roman emperors. So he copied a building that also had a cupola, and that was also an octagon. It's a direct allusion to Byzantine architecture. But would a Byzantine ambassador have been as impressed by Aachen as the Franks? Personally, I doubt it. But when Charlemagne brought the caliph's elephant from Baghdad and kept it in his animal sanctuary in Aachen, he demonstrated that he had his own little Rome, his own little Ravenna. The octagon is Italy brought northward. But the building not only imitates the Italian churches, Charlemagne even had 32 antique columns removed and brought from Ravenna and Rome to Aachen. They serve no purpose but decoration. He had the columns and marbles for this structure brought from Rome and Ravenna, for he could not find such as were suitable elsewhere. He was a constant worshipper at this church as long as his health permitted going morning and evening, even after nightfall, besides attending Mass, and he took care that all the services there conducted should be administered with the utmost possible propriety, very often warning the sextons not to let any improper or unclean thing be brought into the building or remain in it. 
He provided it with a great number of sacred vessels of gold and silver, and with such a quantity of clerical robes that not even the doorkeepers, who fill the humblest office in the church, were obliged to wear their everyday clothes when in the exercise of their duties. But Aachen Cathedral is not a museum. It remains a place of worship, where religious services still have the utmost priority. Church organist Michael Hoppe plays a 19th century choral improvisation by French composer Charles Tournemire. It is a holy place, a place of belief, that has always affected me deeply. These ideal proportions and this soaring height, which seek to evoke holy Jerusalem, are always uplifting. This space where chaos and confusion do not reign, but rather order, harmony, well-being and correct proportion, all of this has been captured and made real here. But that was Charlemagne's idea. He was convinced that the reality of God is greater than the earthly, and he wanted to capture something of that with this building. The priceless cross of Lothair, probably crafted in the 10th century, still serves the liturgy, but only on the holiest of days. The Aachen Cathedral treasury includes more than 5,000 pieces. It is the largest in Germany and of inestimable value, another criterion for the cathedral's listing as a World Heritage Site. The Lothair Cross is in service 11 times a year. Back in the treasury chamber, Art historian Birgitta Falk examines the exceptionally beautiful goldsmithing. I check that the gemstones are all still firmly in their settings. Today I found two that a goldsmith will have to check. Nothing too dramatic, just a little loose. Otherwise, it's in really good condition. The stones sit in quite high settings. These small arches raise them so light comes from below, making the stones glow. 
When you look at them from the side, you might think you're looking at streets and houses of gold and with precious stones for roofs. They evoke Holy Jerusalem, as John described it in Revelations. Some of the gemstones date from antiquity and are much older than the cross itself. The stone in the center of such a jeweled cross usually shows an image of Christ. This one shows a Roman emperor. Just as extraordinary, the arm reliquary of Charlemagne. The arm reliquary was a gift from French King Louis XI. In 1481, he collected money on his estates, 2,000 gold ducats, to have this arm reliquary made by a goldsmith in Lyon. Then he had the finished arm reliquary sent to Aachen. It's thought to contain the ulna and radius of Charlemagne's right forearm. Aachen Cathedral also boasts two world-famous shrines on display in the choir hall. The Shrine of Mary and the Shrine of Charlemagne. Both contain valuable, sacred objects. They've been drawing pilgrims to Aachen for more than 700 years. Aachen has long been a place of pilgrimage. In the Middle Ages, Aachen was, after Rome and Santiago de Compostela, the third largest place of pilgrimage in Europe. Pilgrims have been streaming here since the 12th century. So the collection of Aachen's cathedral treasury also features early souvenirs. The pilgrims came from across Europe, from England, France, Spain, and Bohemia, of course. A lot of Hungarians came too, and Austrians and Italians. In the Middle Ages, that brought thousands upon thousands of pilgrims to the city every seven years. And even if they were often poor, their sheer numbers meant a lot of money flooded into the city. So naturally, they offered the pilgrims something. Pilgrimage books for poorer folks. They contained things of interest to pilgrims, like an explanation of the main treasures. So for little money, they could purchase this souvenir. The oldest ones we have date from 1755. As many as half a million pilgrims came in the 14th century. So many that the octagon couldn't hold all the masses. So, the Gothic choir hall was built. Like the octagon, its structure is spectacular. Its lack of pillars lets light stream in through the stained glass windows without casting shadows which is why it's nicknamed the Glass House of Aachen. Known as the Heiligtumsfahrt, the Aachen pilgrimage takes place every seven years. Pilgrimages are drawing people again today. They're seeking the experience people in the Middle Ages had of setting off on a journey of self-examination and reflection, of walking and having a goal in sight. Those are elements that we can also draw upon during a pilgrimage, meaning having a goal, and a goal that's part of a long spiritual tradition that engages people, which includes church services, culture and encounters. 
The Aachen pilgrimage may have, indirectly, also taken a political stand. In 1937, the Nazis distanced themselves from the Heiligtumsfahrt tradition. In newspapers, they denounced it as bone-worshipping fetishism and banned the pilgrimage. But the pilgrims refused to be intimidated. Close to a million of them flooded into Aachen in 1937. During the Aachen pilgrimage, two goldsmiths use a small hammer to break the padlock on the Shrine of Mary. Inside are four garments revered as sacred relics. The decapitation cloth of John the Baptist, the cloak of the Blessed Virgin, the swaddling clothes of baby Jesus, and the loincloth worn by Christ on the cross. We listen. We know that, at least in Charlemagne's day, these clothes are keepsakes from God himself. At the same time, they are something that can connect us to God in a more tactile way. In the modern world, where we think there's an explanation for everything, encountering sacred relics that are over 1,700, 1,800 years old helps us immerse ourselves in another world and ask, what is it like to encounter phenomena which I can't explain by rational means? Sometimes it makes me feel quite small to think. You're part of a centuries-long tradition and bear the responsibility for this place. You feel both pride and humility when you're part of a tradition and assume the responsibility for it for a certain period of time. That's something special. People are drawn to old garments which seem to have veneration woven into their very fabric. But even textiles that aren't sacred are counted among Aachen Cathedral's treasures. This is an antipendium used to decorate the front of an altar. Embroidered with the image of a bishop, this precious artwork dates from the year 1624. The valuable materials used to make it came from France, Spain, and Italy. Strands of silk thread are used to secure the dyed base material, since a piece like this consists of several layers of fabric. It used to be that people reserved their riches for the church. Those were very often robes, which were gifted to the church. And if you had a ball gown like this from the 18th century, which the ladies wore to court, then you could make two choir gowns or an entire vestment out of it. That's how much material was worked into it. All of those people who donated clothes to be transformed donated the nicest ones they had. In the sacristy, Martin and Veronika Wöhler choose one of these donated fabrics. The father and daughter do volunteer work for the cathedral. 
They're preparing the miraculous image of the Madonna and child for Easter Eve. The pearls will go quite nicely. Yeah. In some different shades of color, the white maybe, or the pearls with the blue in between. Most of the jewelry was donated by a wide variety of people at very different times. Next to the typical things that you often see, like necklaces, which can easily be hung on, especially if they're fairly long, some rather odd things have ended up here. In the boxes we have pocket watches, and I think I even saw a pair of glasses here once. Sometimes it's just fun to look and see what's come together. So, not the necklace. This one here? She's given a change of dress 14 times per year, most often at Easter time. During other times of the year, the change of dress takes place much less frequently. Especially in the summer, there aren't many. Then come more changes at Christmas and Lent, so 14 times in all. These historically valuable textiles are just another piece in the mosaic that's made Aachen Cathedral a World Heritage Site. What does the UNESCO listing mean for the day-to-day -day work with such treasures? It means we attract a lot of public attention. Unfortunately, it doesn't mean that we get any more money. <laughs> that we have to take care of ourselves. But people recognize the value of these treasures, which is underscored by its designation as a World Cultural Heritage Site. During Holy Week, the miraculous Madonna wears a red robe. On Easter Eve, she'll wear a white and gold one. The cathedral has been part of Martin Wuller's life since childhood, when he was a choir boy. He took over this volunteer job from his mother. One of the special things about Aachen Cathedral is that, to this day, the precious decorative pieces on display remain closely tied to the city's residents. In the year 800, Aachen lay in the heart of the kingdom of the Franks. Back then, its forests full of game and its hot springs made it an attractive location for Charlemagne and his court. The chapel was directly connected with Charlemagne's King's Hall. That's because Aachen wasn't just a religious center. It was also a center of worldly power. In the Middle Ages, people had a very concrete concept of power. Where I buy some land, receive a property, or take over a kingdom, I must go and take possession of this realm. And I must show that I can govern it peacefully, so that my power won't be contested. Just one building from Charlemagne's imperial residence is still in existence today. The Granus Tower, a rather puzzling structure. 
At one time, the Granus Tower was thought to date from Roman times, in particular during the Baroque era. Then there was the idea that Charlemagne lived in the tower. Fortificational uses were also briefly considered, as a treasure tower or a jail. Today we assume it was really the representative staircase tower, which was important in the Carolingian court ceremonials and allowed access to the Aula Regia, the King's Hall. Some 2,000 people belonged to Charlemagne's court. The imperial palace, known as the Kaiserliche Pfalz, comprised church and government halls. The imperial palace and the Aachen Cathedral belong together. They're like two poles, one with the spiritual power, the other with the worldly power. In the imperial palaces, there were always churches, two sides of the same coin. So why are the numerous buildings from the palace complex no longer around? Did they burn down in the Great Fire of 1656? What blows of fate did this seat of imperial power experience over the course of 1,200 years? One of the greatest challenges came during the French era. In 1792, not long after the French Revolution, revolutionary forces invaded Aachen. They closed down the churches and monasteries and viewed their treasures as a money-making opportunity. So the people of Aachen hid many of the treasures in Paderborn. The French troops took everything they could get their hands on they even stole the sarcophagus Charlemagne was buried in and carted it off to Paris. Thirty-two of the ancient pillars made of Ravenna marble were broken down, confiscated, and taken to Paris as well. When the political situation changed in France and Napoleon came to power, he developed an interest in Aachen. This painting depicts Napoleon in front of the marble throne. Napoleon viewed himself in the tradition of the Roman emperors and took Charlemagne as his role model. When he was to be crowned Emperor of France, Napoleon even considered conducting the coronation ceremony in Aachen rather than Paris. Napoleon was absolutely conscious of the power of this Roman idea. Napoleon was in a way a son of the French Revolution and an emperor who was, if not medieval, at least invested in continuity and a tradition of medieval power. So he named his son Napoleon II, King of Rome, and thus also claimed this heritage through the title accorded to his son. In 1802, Napoleon founded the Diocese of Aachen and installed a French bishop. As an old imperial city, he made Aachen the capital of the French département of Roer. Napoleon beautified the city and had its sandy hills transformed into a pleasure garden. Napoleon's wife Josephine was also taken with Aachen and spent several months at a health resort here. A painting depicts her in the city with Aachen Cathedral in the background. Two decades later, in 1814, 
the French era in Aachen came to an end. The city became part of the Kingdom of Prussia. How did that affect construction efforts? Prussian conservationists restored the Palatine Chapel and did a very thorough job. The Baroque window frames were removed and the octagon's exterior was purified. Back then, critics bemoaned the total loss of the building's original structure. Inside, the Prussians carried out a restoration that really made their own mark. They destroyed the mosaic on the cupola, dating from the Carolingian period. The golden mosaics visitors marvel at today date from the 19th century. They depict Christ as the Lord of the world. And Charlemagne, bearing his gift, the Marienkirche, which later became Aachen Cathedral. The 19th century mosaics glitter, much of it in gold. In Christianity, gold meant the presence of God on earth. So if something is golden, which was usually only found in churches, it indicates the divine presence. So gold reflected the splendor of heaven here on earth, in the way that every church is basically an image of heavenly Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem. So it's a glimpse of heaven, as that will look after the resurrection or judgment day. And gold always played a very important role. However, the most striking change made during the 19th century was to the walls and pillars. They were covered with marble. This had more to do with the tastes of that time rather than with the building's origins. During the Second World War, Aachen Cathedral was badly damaged. In 1941, a demolition bomb destroyed one of its chapels, and its roofs were hit. But young boys, who'd formed a guard to keep watch over the cathedral, prevented the worst from happening. They smothered the flames and saved the octagon's wooden roof construction. With its striking silhouette, Aachen Cathedral isn't just the city's most famous landmark. It's a symbol of continuity, even after periods of transformation and devastation. Today, the challenges are largely economic. But even if some wealthy investor fancied creating a lofty monument to himself near the cathedral, that's prohibited within 500 meters, on all sides. This buffer zone protects the area all around the structure. It protects the cathedral from buildings springing up in this zone, like high-rises, for example. And as World Heritage Manager, I'm included during the planning of buildings, and I have a say in that. Whether I think it's good, or whether I say, no, that's a bit too high, and would detract from the cathedral. So I try to ensure that, when it comes to construction, no damage is done to the World Heritage Site. The entry in UNESCO's World Heritage List is both an honor and a responsibility. So many generations have shaped Aachen Cathedral, each making it their own and reinterpreting it. The World Heritage Listing is confirmation that the cathedral is an extraordinary structure of outstanding universal value.
Aachen Cathedral was constantly being modified. And so every view of Charlemagne is the fruit of its own era. The past is always instrumentalized or used as vindication to show things turning out well or not so well. And of course today, Charlemagne could be presented in a positive light as a man who unified diverse regions of Europe, if you forget that he did it with blood and iron. There's always this ambiguity. When you're in Aachen, you're in a place that's very Carolingian and strongly charged with the history which transformed this place. Carolingian, Gothic and Baroque. Aachen Cathedral is a mix of different architectural styles. But every stone laid here added to its history. Ours is the first era that's chosen not to add more buildings to the cathedral, but rather to preserve it. And what luck that the old legend about its initial construction didn't come true. Legend has it that the devil was so angry about the trick with the wolf that he planned to fill up the entire cathedral with sand. Luckily, that never happened. And 1,200 years later, Aachen Cathedral is still standing. It stood the test of time and might well for all eternity.